Running a good race is like putting your hand in warm water. At first it feels pretty good, and then every so often you make it hotter and hotter and hotter. And then with about a quarter of the race to go, you want it to be as hot as you can possibly stand it and leave it in as long as possible. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, who was hooked on lime jalapeno chips while pregnant, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 91 of the Running For Real podcast. And this is a bonus episode. I want to share this with you for thanking the Patreon members who are supporting me every month. If you are one of those people, you make this possible right now. I did say if I am over $500 for the month in support, then I will give you a bonus episode. And as of this recording, we are over 500 and I, but we are close. So we might not be able to have a bonus episode in January if you do not continue to support me. Or if you are a new listener, maybe you could come check it out and support me in the future. But I want to thank everyone who is a supporter on Patreon. It means the world and allows me to be able to keep doing this. So thank you very much. All right. So as I mentioned, this is a bonus episode. This was originally meant to be on a 5k podcast series I was recording. Now, you know, uh, if you are a current listener, you know that I created six podcast series, uh, mental training, beginners, marathon, nutrition, pregnancy and postpartum and coming back from injury. And I made these series about a year ago, uh, while I was going to be having my daughter, I wanted to have some podcasts for you guys to listen to. I knew you were going to miss them, uh, miss me being around. And uh, I created them and I was working on a 5K series. But as Bailey came so early, I never got the chance to finish that series. And so this episode has been sitting aside for about a year. And I feel absolutely terrible to my guests um, for not releasing these episodes when they gave me their time. But now I am going to release this one out to the world. And this is such a good one. Today, I have Michael Joyner on the show. Uh, Dr. Joyner has his own research lab in the Mayo Clinic, and he focuses on how we respond to exercise both physiologically and mentally. And you know he has some good research going on at the Mayo Clinic. I wanted to bring him on to go into the science behind the 5K so you can truly understand what you're doing and why we need to do certain workouts if you really want to maximize what you are able to do. Now, I know we have many 5K listeners um, and maybe you do feel a bit neglected, like a lot of the episodes focus on the longer distances, but there's nothing wrong with the 5K. I mean, many of us have heard Lauren Fleshman talking about why she thinks it's the best distance And I think many of us agree and and we can easily shy away from doing a 5k when in fact that's actually the thing that we really need. Uh, Some speed work can also help you in the longer distances but it's also a bit fun and it's great that you can do it every week without being beaten up every week and there's not so much pressure and you know this is really going to be a great episode to help you you know truly understand what you're doing and Michael also shares the absolute best workout you can possibly do to train for a 5k and he tells you exactly how to do it and there will be a link in the show notes to kind of explain that so you can uh, find out more about that in the future. So without any further ado I am going to bring us on into this special chat that I had with Dr. Michael Joyner and we'll get right to this episode. Michael, thank you so much for joining me on this special series of the Running For Real podcast. I'm really excited to dive in today to the real the real physiology and just understanding the 5K. So thanks for giving your time to, to explain it to us today. My pleasure, Tina. <laughs> this is going to be fun. And we're kind of going to look at, um, you know, how we respond to 5k training, the aspects we need to consider and just kind of breaking it down in a way that um, most runners who have trained for the 5k might have never had this explained to them before. But firstly, you know, you focus on uh, in your work, you focus on how humans respond to, you know, various forms of physical and mental stress during exercise. So maybe you could start with what the biggest misconception is when it comes to those um, and uh, just kind of explain a bit about what you do. 
You know, I have a lab at the Mayo Clinic where we study human physiology. And as you mentioned, we study how humans respond to physical and mental stress. Mm -hmm. Now, I got my start almost 40 years ago as a subject, mm -hmm. a study on the lactate threshold, really one of the original studies on the lactate threshold. I was running for the University of Arizona, and, and I got the research bug as a result. And that's kind of a good segue to talk about human performance. So I've continued to be interested in that since the late 1970s. But as I branched off, I'm interested also in how people respond to blood loss because I am a clinical anesthesiologist, how people respond to hypoxia or low levels of oxygen, how people uh, respond to the standing position, uh, what changes when people age. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of really interesting stuff on blood pressure and how it's different in men and women. And more importantly, how menopause affects it in women. So the, I'm mm -hmm. interested in a lot of things, but the foundational stuff is exercise and, and one of the great things about the 5K is it's a terrific range where it's one of those things, literally anybody almost can do it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you're really serious about it and you maximize your 5K training, it's almost exactly what you need to do to run a fast marathon, believe it or not. So it's mm -hmm. this tremendously flexible thing that takes you, you know, from fitness all the way to, um, you know, doing your very best and, and reaching your physiological limit. Okay. So that's great. Yeah. Um, so speaking of that, you know, um, you just said about, uh, how it kind of, uh, is the one training segment or tra style you can do where you can actually, um, you know, train all the levels of your body. And like you said, someone can pick it up from the beginning and right. take it to have their best marathon. But for someone listening, who's thinking, how does 5k training help me with a marathon? Like surely that's way too far. Maybe right. explain what you mean by that. Well, one of the things about 5K training is that, that you really have to, to optimize what's called your maximal oxygen uptake. So if you're going to run a fast 5K or run your very best 5K, typically people do a lot of longer intervals mm -hmm. that are serious about it. So they do repeat half miles, repeat kilometers, repeat three quarters of a mile or repeat miles. And those are the types of interval sessions that absolutely help you reach your biological potential for your VO2 max. Well, it turns out VO2 max is also important for the marathon. So I think it's that's a kind of a biological example. The other thing is, is depending on if you're really fast or, 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 or more of a recreational runner, you're, you're going to be going somewhere between 13 or 14 minutes and perhaps, you know, 25 or 30 minutes. And that, that's going to be faster than your marathon pace, but it's still going to be a pace that you have to sustain for a while. So if you get fast, it'll feel a lot more comfortable when you're actually uh, running marathon mm, pace. Mm -hmm. I think so it, it, some of it's physiology and then some of it is just getting used to running faster. Yeah. And if you look at like the great Elliot Kipchoge, who we all hear so much about now, you know, Kipchoge's got excellent times at 5,000 meters and 10,000 meters. He's also got a very fast mile time. And so I think one of the things that, that used to happen more back in the first running boom in the 70s and 80s is a lot of people were running 5Ks, 5 miles, and 10Ks, and then they were adding the marathon later versus, you know, um, training for a marathon so specifically. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably, hopefully, why most people who are listening to this right now are in it. Um, but from what I was reading, you actually also agree that there's less chance of becoming injured with this style of training as well. Why is that? Well, I think one of the things people have to think about is their total volume of training. And I think people need to think about the mix between intensity, volume, and so forth. And so, so as people train for a 5K, it's possible to run a very fast 5K without running a lot of mileage. I think one of the other things, uh, Tina, that's been so useful in the triathlon era is people, especially recreational folks, are much more likely to do cross training, elliptical, swimming, biking on their on their easy days. So I think one of the things people have thought about, you know, over the years is one day hard or long mm -hmm. and either one or two days easy. So get in a little bit of a cycle and perhaps no more than five or six hard days in, a, in every every two weeks. So one of the things you can do if you run around a fast 5K is do those longer intervals, do a few faster runs, but you don't have to make them 10, 20 miles long. They only have to be five, six, seven miles long. Yep. And then on your other days, if you're a recreational runner, you can uh, simply um, 
do the bike, do the elliptical and so forth. And if you're a beginner, you can continue to do that, you know, jog a little bit, bike or elliptical the next day, jog a little bit. And then over the, over the course of time, add a mile here, add a mile there, and you won't have any problem. Mm, That's so true. And I'm glad you mentioned cross training because I think that is, you know, a lot of runners do come up with injuries time and time again. And that's a good way of building that, you know, aerobic base without actually putting that pounding on your legs. So I'm glad you mentioned that. And, um, and then when it comes to, you know, the physiology of, of what's going on here. So someone who has been maybe doing marathon training, um, uh, right. or if they haven't been running at all, what kind of, uh, adaptations are going to occur within their body as they start to get used to this training that is quite high intensity, um, compared to other things. So let's take somebody who's already run some marathon, say somebody who's, you know, fast, but in the middle of the pack, less than four hours, but maybe greater than three hours. So what's going to be interesting for those folks is that they're going to have to run substantially some, you know, five or 10% of their miles faster than race pace. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of simple tricks you can use. It's difficult sometimes uh, to find a training group or find people to use interval, uh, to do intervals with. So one of the things that three to four hour marathoner can do who runs, wants to run a five fat, a fast 5k is use the treadmill one or two times a week and do some three or four minutes hard, two or three minutes easy. So the easy would be if, if your marathon pace is eight or nine minute miles, the easy pace is maybe 10 or 11 minute miles but the fast pace may be seven minute miles. So alternate between that. The other thing I think people can do, especially if they have a nice running trail nearby or a bike trail that they run on, is take their uh, watch with a beeper on it and set it for a minute yep. and go minute on, minute off, minute on, minute off. And mm -hmm. the key there is to have them stride those minute fast and don't really slow down, but just take your foot off the accelerator. So do that at the end of a end of your five or ten mile runs. Do that for ten or fifteen, twenty minutes, and you'll get tremendous gains in your fitness. Tremendous gains in your fitness. Your five k or ten k time will come down, and then believe it or not, when you go to run another marathon, your marathon time will likely improve. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the experienced recreational runner. Um, the person who's just starting and maybe hasn't done anything, I think it's just a matter of run every other day. Do what you can, walk and jog, eventually get to the point where you can jog a mile, then add a little bit here and a little bit there, and cross train as needed, and, and then get, get to the point where you're running, you know, two or three miles every other day, and you shouldn't have a problem finishing a 5K. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. And then earlier on at the beginning of the interview, you mentioned that, you know, training seriously to the 5K is going to get you close to your biological potential for yep. aerobic fitness. What did you mean by that? So your maximal oxygen uptake is sort of like the size of your engine. It's how much oxygen you can use during maximum exercise. And usually it's that the speed mm -hmm. when you do a treadmill test and you get a velocity at maximal oxygen uptake, it's highly related to your 3K or 5K time. And so that really, and the type of training that, that really maximizes your maximal oxygen uptake, which is your cardiac output, and how the skeletal muscle takes all that blood and gets all the oxygen out of it. The type of training that really maximizes that is these long three to five minute intervals. And that's exactly what people do to run the, the 5K. And, and historically, you know, people, people um, forget about it. People like Frank Shorter and others were excellent track racers, mm -hmm. excellent track racers. Um, and so I think that, that historically, People ran these shorter races, and then all they did, they really continued to train like track runners, and then they just did a long run on Sunday. I think that's still a really valid way to train. And if you if you look at what, uh, again, what the great Elliot Kipchoge was doing, I looked um, um, recently online, and in one of his training diaries was published. And what struck me about it is, is, is it was exactly what Frank Shorter and Bill Rogers were doing in the 1970s and 1980s. So, you know, nothing new again. Yeah. I mean, it was incredible how similar they were. Did, uh, did you mention that to him or had someone brought that up? I, I, I tweeted about it and other people chimed in and, <laughs> and then a couple of the old timers. And in fact, Rogers himself responded and said he wished he could do it now. <laughs> he I'm that fast now, but, but it was, you know, it was a lot of miles, a lot of miles run relatively fast and two or three good track or fartlek sessions per week. 
And some of the track sessions were longer and some of them were 400, you know, 400 meter repeats or minute on minute off, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, And yeah, I I think that's, that's important to mention. And, you know, it's good for people to see an example there of how it actually does translate to the longer stuff. But for people who are thinking, you know, I don't understand how you can say a 5k is, is aerobic when I'm breathing hard the whole time. I'm breathing, you know, my breathing's really difficult. What does that mean? So, you know, when you think about when you start to breathe, that happens right about your lactate threshold. So typically, as people go faster and faster, not a whole lot happens to the lactic acid levels in their blood. Mm -hmm. But when they get to an untrained person, about 50 or 60 percent of their maximum, lactic acid levels start to rise. And that's about when people get short of breath. At one point, people thought the two were causally linked. That, that the lactate was driving your breathing. That's not exactly true, and this has been a controversial area since I started. But it turns out that's when people really start to feel like it's hard. You've seen one of those rating of perceived exertion scales. That's right around you know, 14, 15, 16 on the rating of perceived exertion, mm-hmm. the 6 to 20 scale. And so what happens is the 5K is, is 18 or 19, and it's a velocity very similar to the velocity required to elicit maximal oxygen uptake. So in addition to um, using all aerobic, all of your aerobic capacity, over the course of the race, if you're really going all out, you're also using all of your anaerobic capacity yeah. over time. So it's a really a, a kind of a mixed bag. And as a result, to do it well, you have to train all of your energy systems. You also have to train your neuromuscular system to run fast. And, and it, so it's just really a, a training sweet spot, mm-hmm. training sweet spot. Mm-hmm. And what are each of those, you know, you said about the energy systems, just maybe give us a general overview of what those are. Well, you obviously got the aerobic energy system, which is, you know, you breathe air in, take it up in your lungs, gets to your blood, you pump it around with your heart, the skeletal muscle uses it in the mitochondria. Mm-hmm. Then you have the ability to do anaerobic glycolysis, and then you also have some energy stores, creatine phosphate stores. So the creatine phosphate stores, uh, if that's all you had, would be gone in a you know matter of seconds mm-hmm. or, or 20 seconds or so. The anaerobic ones can last a, a little bit longer, maybe a minute or two, but you stretch those out over the course of, of, of a 5K, so you're not using them all at once. And, and obviously the vast majority of it's gonna be aerobic, but still you're gonna have very high lactic acid levels and a big anaerobic component uh, especially the last, say, half or 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 or, or, or one third of a five k race. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right, that's good to know. And uh, just for those who are interested in, you know, learning a little bit more about it, I thought I would would just ask. And you can obviously research more if you want to dive into the science more. But um, let's talk about, you know, we've we've already said that the five k can help you for long distances. It can, you know, it might seem counterintuitive, but now it makes sense after you explaining it. But does how does 5K training for someone who wants to lose weight or to tone up, does that tend to kind of help your metabolism uh, because you're doing lots of those short, sharp things? What I would say, Tina, is that most people, most people who want to lose weight need to do something other than just straight exercise. Now, it's possible to lose a lot of weight with exercise, but you've really got to exercise a lot. Mm-hmm. And one of the problems is people, you know, think I'm going to exercise 30 minutes a day and lose weight. And either they eat a little bit more or they, they lay around the rest of the time. They have sort of a compensatory inactivity. Yep. So I think the current thinking about kind of weight loss for the average citizen is that exercise is essential, but it's got to go hand in glove with caloric restriction. Then when people have lost the weight, exercise is critical to keep it off. Now, a couple of things. One is if you do a little higher intensity exercise, it probably suppresses your appetite a little bit more, and that may help you restrict your eating. I think the other thing that can help people restrict their eating if they want to lose weight is to have a goal. Okay. And it's one thing to have a goal about losing weight. It's another to have a goal about finishing your race or running a certain time. Mm -hmm. And if one of the things that has to happen for you to finish a race or, or run a certain time is to lose 10 or 20 pounds. Maybe that's a better way to frame your goal, to motivate yourself. So so I think, again, for the average, average person, it's a combination of the two, and they they need to go hand in glove because people do have a tendency to do a little bit less. 
And I think the other thing people have to do if they do start training to in an effort to lose some weight is to make sure they also build in a whole lot of low-grade physical activity in their day, park a little farther away, take the stairs, try to walk a little bit more, that sort of thing. You know, put the remote up uh, and, and, and get off your phone. So I think those, so, so it's, it's a really a comprehensive thing. Mm-hmm. The, the nice thing in terms of health benefits is the health benefits of physical activity and exercise are curvilinear. So people that are out there running 100 miles a week are not getting any more health benefits than people that are running 50 or 40 or 30. And it probably tops off at, at um, the guidelines are around 150 minutes a week of moderately vigorous physical activity. It probably tops off somewhere between 300 and 450. Minute, so that's, uh, you're saying that's maxed. That's where you're going to get the maximum for health benefits okay. in terms of longevity. Yeah. It's not saying it's max to get to reach a personal yeah, best yeah, or yeah. run fast or do anything else. But if you're just, if you're just worried about your health, go out, go out, walk, jog, ride a bike for 30 to 60 minutes most days. Okay. You know, cut the grass, do errands, that sort of thing. So can if that be broken up like that then? You know, let's well, say. There is, actual, there is actual evidence that, that three 10 minute bouts are almost as good as one 30 minute bout. Okay. And I think that's one of the keys that people need to think about in our in our society is to break it up and get some other uh, forms of physical activity. I was just in Denmark, where 50 percent or more of the of the kind of short trips in, in Copenhagen are taken by bike. They've got this tremendous infrastructure set up to deal with this. And, you know, if you're if you're zipping around on your bike or going to meet a friend for lunch and it's a one or two mile bike ride, I mean, that that puts the whole calorie equation in kind of a different, different, uh, different balance. Same in, mm-hmm. same in, in Amsterdam. And, and there are, are plenty of these, uh, you know, um, well-built muscular Northern European people, but you don't see a lot of fat ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I noticed that, um, in Amsterdam as well, when I was there visiting last year, I noticed that everyone, it wasn't about, you know, I'm going to go exercise. It was just, I'm cycling to a friend's house or I'm cycling to work. And there were so many people and, just like you said, the infrastructure, it was great seeing, seeing bike paths and being absolutely full right. of people. Um, but it's not really a chore cause it's just part of daily life. So that, that was really cool to see. And I think that's important that you mentioned, cause we can also often get into the mindset as runners of thinking, well, I ran today, so I yeah, right. don't need to do anything else. Cause I've done this m- many minutes of exercise, but actually right. You do find you feel better if you do keep moving around, and 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 I think that's important to. The other to thing, mention. Tina, have you read this book? And I, I I know your listeners would really like it too, called uh, "Can Running or How Running Can Save the World." Oh no, I haven't, but I will put By that in a package. Called, or not running, cycling. Excuse me, how cycling can save the world. Okay. By a guy called Peter Walker, who's a, a editorialist for the Guardian. Okay. He's written this terrific book with anecdotes about how to make cities and communities cycling safe and so forth. And there's there's stories, his own personal stories, a bike messenger in London and how he became very fit mm-hmm. as a result uh, from kind of a 90-pound weekly. Mm. And then um, also the study, stories about Amsterdam and Denmark. And then then he's also got the links to the scientific literature and also the the what's called the gray literature, technical reports from communities, governments. And so forth. So it's just an absolute wealth of information for anybody who's interested in, in physical activity and transportation policy, as well as the exercise aficionados who listen to your uh, your podcast. Okay, great. Thank you. I will definitely put a link to that in the guide that goes along with this uh, series. So thank you for that. Um, and then you you know with this whole thing. So if someone is kind of doing little bout, let's say they run 30 minutes in the morning, they do maybe some pickups and faster stuff in there, yep. and then they're doing kind of bouts of 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, are they going to get any fitter that could pay off in the 5K, or is this just generally like health-wise you're going to feel better? Health-wise, if, if they kept a little bit of weight off and dropped a little bit of weight, that would help. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if you really want to run a fast 5K, then you've got to progress through the sort of 30 minute jogger finisher to I'm going to do a little bit more, incorporate a little bit of interval training into what I do, do some pickups. Uh, maybe when I get to a hill, hilly part of my run, I'm going to push the uphill and, and mm-hmm. cruise the downhill. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm going to um, 
you know, go fast the last mile in if I'm doing a four or five mile run or, or you know, a lot of places there's a, a trail around a lake or yeah. uh, something here or there. And I'm going to try to pass everybody who's pushing a stroller or whatever it is. <laughs> I play a lot of games. I run stroller to, you know, uh, stride from stroller to stroller. Yeah. Uh, it can, can be a lot of fun and, and kind of an interesting way uh, to do things. Okay, great. So then what have you found to be the key components um, you know, you've mentioned some of them there, but just a bit more specific with people. Um, when you said hills, should people do hill repeats? Uh, when it comes to intervals, like how much right. is needed, things like that. Right. Well, here, here's what I think. I think people have to exploit their natural environment. I lived out in Arizona for many years. It was a terrific place to run. You could go run in these incredible mountain trails through these cactus forests. And it was just fantastic, right? So you'd be a knucklehead if you lived in Arizona to do a lot of running on your road because yeah. there are these other places to run. On the other hand, you know, if I was living in Manhattan, I think there's a, on the, on the east side of the river, there's a, a tartan track someplace and you've got the reservoir right in central park. I think I'd do an awful lot of interval training and fartlek training. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, where are you going to do a hill up the Brooklyn bridge? <laughs> Yep. Uh, in, in the stairs. So I think you have to tailor it to what you can do. Okay. I think, um, you know, you may or may not have access to a treadmill depending on what you're going to do. So I think there's a couple of things that really are important. One is be consistent, develop a plan you can stick with. If you're injured you, and can't train, you can't either meet your goals, finish a race or go faster. That's the first thing. The second thing is I think you probably want to do one at least one session of shorter pickups per week. If it's on the track, it might be 200s or 400s. If it's with your stopwatch, it might be 30 seconds on or a minute or a minute and a half, two minutes perhaps. So I think you want to do something like that with a total of 10 to 20 minutes of relatively fast running. Okay. That would just be a, a kind of a, a rule of thumb. You need to, to customize it for yourself. I think you'd want to do somewhere between four and six repeats of between a half mile and a mile, maybe three to six. Again, customize it for yourself. Obviously, if you're doing half miles, you might do five or six. If you're doing miles, you might do three or three or, or four. And typically, I, the, to me, the, the work to rest interval, so in other words, how much jogging should you do between a fast interval, should be about 50% of the time or maybe 100% of the time. And that varies. Hyperfit people can get a buy, buy with less. So that means if you're running 400 meters, you do 400 um, fast, 200 easy, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Minute on, minute off. Or, or, or if you're doing repeat miles in six or seven minutes, maybe take four minutes of jogging, that type of thing. So I think those are things. And then I think the other thing is we call them threshold runs now. We used to call them controlled runs in the old days. People call them tempo runs. There's a gazillion things to call them. And that's basically a, a fast, steady run, but right at that sort of level where it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You can do that a couple of ways. One is you can plan to do it. The other is just to pick up the last three or four miles of, of a run okay. once or twice. So is this essentially a tempo run that you're talking about? Yeah, tempo, tempo run, threshold run, control run. There's, if you know, it, they're, they're all the same. Mm -hmm. And and so I think that those are also helpful. So I think in general, you want to have one faster interval or fart leg session, one longer interval or fart leg session, and then a tempo run. Mm -hmm. And I think those are the three key things. If you can do one of each per week, great, or do two out of three per week, but get yourself on a sustainable cycle of, like I said, hard day, easy day, or hard day, easy, easy. And so forth. I think when you're younger, you can go hard easy. But as, as I've gotten older and as my friends have gotten older, whether it's weightlifting, swimming, running, whatever, you find that you, some days what used to take, you know, 24 or 48 hours to recover from now takes, takes uh, you know, uh, two or three days. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure you give yourself adequate recovery because, again, you don't want to get hurt. Okay. And then what about the long run? How does that come into this? Is that included well, in the tempo? I think the long run... I, I think, you know, you, you can get by without doing a real long run. You know, I think 10 or 12 or 15 miles is plenty for an experienced runner who's trying to go fast. And if you keep it at that at that kind of low double figure, say 10 or 12 miles, you, that's plenty, okay. plenty to run fast 5K. And then you're in a situation, if you want to go up 10K, half marathon, marathon, you can add a little bit every Sunday. Mm -hmm. so, so I think, you know, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, fast on the long run on Sunday. Okay. 
with easy days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I think that, that that's sort of a classic mixed training program. Yeah. It works. Okay. And then just on the other side of things, for someone thinking, I'm a 5K, that's three miles. Why do I need to do 10 to 12 miles? How is that going to help them? Right. I think it'll help you recover. And if you look at how the energy systems, especially the mitochondria and the little tiny blood vessels in your capillaries adapt, uh, it, it's helpful to have 90-minute sessions, roughly 90, 60 to 90-minute sessions to make sure that those are maximized. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's, that's you know been shown many, many times. So a little bit of over-distance help. Now, certainly, certainly there are people historically who have trained very, very little and basically um, done only part of what I tell you, the hard part. And, and I had an experience doing that. I, I, I was a pretty good runner, ran 1438 in college and got into medical school. I didn't have the time I once had. And um, Basically, uh, I ran almost as fast, just over 15 minutes in medical school, and my workouts consisted of either jogging two miles, running one mile to a four-mile loop, running around the loop as fast as I possibly could and going in and out on the phone poles, mm -hmm. and running home. I did nothing beyond that. I would do that two or three or four times a week. The rest of the time, I'd run two miles. So, you know, I had a pretty good base from other things, but... but I, Running 25 or 30 miles a week, um, it was possible to run quite fast. I ran a fast 10K as well. The thing I noticed about it, Tina, when I did not do 60, 70, 80 miles a week, and I'd done more than that previously, when I didn't do uh, that sort of mileage, boy, you really suffered at the end of the race. I'd have a headache mm -hmm. for a couple of days after I ran fast versus feeling good in 30 minutes. Okay. So that's more encouragement to, although you can get away with it, to do the training yeah. to prevent <laughs> discomfort in the future. <laughs> Yeah, but but you know, but then you you just have to ask yourself how much you want to suffer. Mm -hmm. That's true. <laughs> but I think also part of it comes down to if you haven't done the suffering through the training, um, it can be difficult to push yourself in a race when you haven't put right, that time right, and commitment into it. Right. I, I think one of the reasons you, you know uh, I wrote a thing uh, for Runners World in Alex Hutchinson's column where I talked about doing the classic twenty times four hundred meter workout. And one of the great things is when I go to crowds where there's a lot of experienced runners, I say, who's done 20 times 400 meters? And only people more than 50 have done it. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that fell by the wayside uh, sometime in the 1970s or later 80s. And, and people got a little bit more moderate with their interval training. So you say, wow, you know, the, old, the older I get, the better I was or, or all these sorts of, of, of urban legends. But one of the advantages of doing something like that, especially under control, is you learn to manage your suffering. Mm. And I had a, a coach one time said, look, to run a good, whether it's a 5K, a 10K, or a marathon, half marathon, running a good race is like putting your hand in warm water. At first, it feels pretty good. And then every so often, you make it hotter and hotter and hotter. And then with about a quarter of the race to go, you want it to be as hot as you can possibly stand it and leave it in as long as possible. And this sort of ratcheting up of your effort. Mm. Uh, to right till you get to the edge and then trying to hang on the last bit of the race, A, you can really learn to do that in a 5K. And B, by doing higher volume intervals where you descend the intervals and really do them under control, the first five are fast, the next five are faster, the next five are a little faster, and the last five are really challenging. Mm -hmm. That's a terrific way to do it. I, I saw something that Shalane Flanagan did five miles, four miles, three miles, two miles, and one mile prior to her big victory uh, in New York City in November of, 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 of this year. Or, or, and, and what was uh, interesting about that is, and with, with three or four minutes rest in between, but, but that I think she really taught herself how, how, how to run through the sort of suffering and to maintain yeah. her. Because oh, yeah. oh, she looked so terrific. At the end. She looked like Secretariat. Yeah. Tremendous tempo, tremendous drive, tremendous leg lift, posture, I mean, I mean textbook. And I think that's the sort of session uh, that hardened her both mentally, but then gave her the physical skills to manage her suffering and, and to uh, maintain that tempo and relaxation in spite of this effort and, and pain. Mm -hmm. So true. And, and, you know, workouts like that are very powerful. And I mean, that's definitely a great example of that. And I love that you said about the 20 by 400, because I can put my hand up. Um, my husband yeah. is a huge fan of that workout. Um, I've done 20 to 25 by 400, probably 
15 times. I, he Good loves it. Um, and uh, so for someone listening, um, you know, I want you to explain that. But before I do, um, yep. the thing I always loved about that one was that you feel like a, uh, you can take on anything after you finish it. When you run yeah, 20 by 400. Builder. Yeah, it's such a, such a confidence with a, builder. With a, 200, with a 200 jog is the classic way. And so what, what you do, you know, you don't, first of all, don't do a long warm up. So, you, you know, you go out and run two or three miles. And I, what I would recommend is people go out and jog for two and, and run the first one faster than you were going, but not all out. And so if you're a pretty good runner, you might run the first two or three, say, at your marathon pace. Then you might run, you know, the next four or five at your 10K pace. Then you might run the next four or five somewhere between your 5K and 10K pace. Now you've knocked off about 12 or 15 of them and the fun begins. So the goal, the goal is to descend the workout and have this tremendous discipline. Develop a rhythm. You're running with somebody else. You do the 400, then you jog the 200, and you go again. And 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 then you 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 get to about five left to go, and and then you have a chance to have a religious experience. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so then what you want to be in a position to do is say run you know the 14th or 15th one right at your 5k pace or a little faster, and then try to de- take one or two seconds off the last each one. Mm-hmm. So if if you were if you were you know a world class runner you might start off running the first couple at sixty seven and then you or, or seventy and then you drift into the middle sixties and then be hanging around the lower sixties but you know the last four might be sixty one sixty fifty nine fifty seven yeah something like that if you were a world class runner so you need to calibrate that for your own individual fitness level and so forth and then go run. Uh, two miles. And in the olden days, we used to then go drink some beer, but you probably don't want to do that. You want to get a, some chocolate milk and a protein load and rehydrate a more responsible way. But, <laughs> but uh, the beers are sure tasted good. That's all I will tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not surprised after that. And one thing I will say to anyone, if you do go out and do this is, um, I tended to find that you, you don't feel that much worse after 15 than you do after five. The last few are really going to hurt. But you feel so strong. Like at the same time, I always remember the last three or four, as much as they were hurting, I felt so strong. And I just get, like you said, you get faster and you just, you can barely believe it's happening. I think, Tina, the other thing is you got to activate the no bend over rule. When you finish one, if you're bending over, you're going too fast. You want to just be standing up and you want to, again, just take your foot off the accelerator, get into your 200 meter jog and go again. Yeah. Yeah. And start, you know, start by running eight and add, add, you know, I mean, I mean, people used to do this once a week, but you got to be under control. Start with eight and add one or two a week and then get to where you're doing it and, and enjoy life. I don't run as much as I used to uh, do some orthopedic problems, but I, I do uh, two minutes on one minute off on my bike, mm-hmm. you know, while I'm watching, watching TV or whatever on my, my uh, trainer. And again, you can have quite a bit of fun doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's definitely another way of doing it is just minutes. And, and, and then, you know, the swimmers do 100 meter repeats if you're a triathlete. And they typically use a little shorter rest and so forth. But, but um, you know, I always tell people if, if you could only do one workout, that would be up there. Okay. Yep. No, I agree. That, I love that. that. Yeah, and, and anyway, the great Emil Zadepec, he sometimes went farther than that and did more. <laughs> and he didn't always do them. Sometimes they were more at cruise speed you know, for him. But, you know, certainly the great Emil Zadepec made a living mm-hmm. running 400s. And, and Bob Shule, we're talking about 5,000-meter runners. You know, the great Bob Shule, the only American ever to win the 5,000 in 1964. And maybe, uh, Tina, you can get a, people a link to the, to the finish of the uh, Tokyo yep. 5,000 yep. years, where Shule runs on a wet, dirt track. He runs close to three minutes, the last, uh, the last bit. And, and his last 400 was faster than Meb, uh, not Meb, uh, Faster than Mo Farah's was in London. Wow. A wet dirt track. It's one of the more <laughs> remarkable races ever. But Shul was one of the last great intervals twice a day, every day runner. Yep. And and uh, he certainly did a lot of 400s. Yeah. So, so you know, if, and there's most places there's a high school track nearby or, or, or something else where you can do these. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, 20 times 400. I recommend it. Give yourself a, a, a present. 
<laughs> and when should this be? It like which ro- workout that you were describing earlier with this uh, B class? That would be the faster pickups. But the great thing about twenty times four hundred is okay. So say you do a two mile warm up and you're an experienced runner. Then you do you know twenty times four hundred is five miles, and then the 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 uh, two hundred jogs in between are another two and a half, and then you run two miles to cool down. So you know this 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 touches all bases if you think about it, because Mm -hmm. you get some distance in, especially if you do it continuously and, and, and just get into it. So you end up getting 10 or 11 miles in, uh, uh, 12 miles even. And, and you you know, you, it it is really a gift that keeps giving. Yeah. You get some speed work in, you get some really over distance in while you're at it. Typically I said, you want to do longer intervals to get your VO2 max as high as possible. But if you descend it the way I described, and make sure you keep jogging if you're an experienced runner during that during that um, interval rest. Uh, you'll get everything you want out of that that okay. workout. All right, really powerful. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. And one last area that I wanted to kind of ask you about. You touched on it for a minute earlier, but you know, let's talk about lactic acid now. People yeah. typically think of it as that burn at the end of a race, um, right. but most actually have it wrong when they think about what lactic acid is and that it's this bad, horrible thing. Tell us about lactic acid. Well, you know, my favorite uh, thing is 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 um, I was watching the Tour de France one day on TV, and Bob Roll, you know, who's this hyper enthusiastic commentator, said if they don't train on their off days, the lactic acid stays in their muscle and it turns to wood. <laughs> well, it turns out the lactic acid is gone from your muscle if you jog after a hard effort in twenty or thirty minutes, if not yeah. faster. So, you know. Breathing oxygen on the sideline, jogging the next day, all these wives' tales aren't true. So what happens is, is lactic acid is formed when glycolysis or glycogen breakdown is stimulated in your muscle and the amount of glucose being metabolized that turns to pyruvate can't be taken up by the mitochondria in your skeletal muscle. That's the stuff in your skeletal muscle that makes them red, makes mm-hmm. them slow twitch, gives them their endurance, increases with training. And so what happens is a byproduct of that is lactic acid. Now, the lactate itself is just a metabolite. It leaks out of your muscle, your heart burns it, your liver burns it, your kidneys can burn it. All sorts of wonderful things happen with it. Now, the acid part can contribute to the fatigue, and that probably helps or or can give you that sort of burning sensation. But there are other things that give you burning sensations. There are patients who don't make any lactic acid, for a variety of enzymatic reasons in their muscle, they still feel the burning sensation and they still have a, an exercise response that is not completely dissimilar to normal people's. Mm-hmm. So we focus on the lactate threshold and certainly the lactate threshold is very relevant to how fast you can run. Which is right but, when you're right on the edge of it, correct? Yeah, it's right on the edge, right. Yep. And it's typically about marathon pace. But the the... You know, correlation isn't cause and effect, and the story about lactic acid isn't that your muscles are out of oxygen and that as a result of being hypoxic or ischemic, you start making lactic mm-hmm. acid, lactic acid makes fatigue, and that it's what makes you sore the next day. Mm-hmm. That represents a collection of either gross oversimplifications or just flat-out wives' tales <laughs> that, that are out there. And I did a, a little piece for Sports Illustrated Online about myths about lactic acid, and, and I can send you the link, and you you can yep. you can post that because uh, it, it's quite interesting and, and tries to get over some of the wives' tale. And, and but you know you'll be watching sports on TV and hear the same old thing over and over again. Yeah. And so your conclusion is that the sportscasters missed their exercise biochemistry class. <laughs> Probably true. <laughs> Too busy skipping it to go to their sports. Yeah. <laughs> um, sure. So then what does make us sore? You know, you said that that's not the reason we're sore. What, why are we sore after hard days? Typically, you know, I notice when you run downhill, you can be quite sore. So typically it's, it's, it's the type of soreness we think about is delayed muscle soreness, the stuff that really makes you, you, you sore, you know, 24, 40, uh, even 72 hours later. And that's typically due to downhill running, breaking, eccentric contractions, and that's micro damage to the muscle, especially in and around where the the, the tendons attach and so forth. That's been really well worked out, mm-hmm. and and uh, people can adapt to it. You know, if you, if you're going to do a lot of trail running, people learn how to run downhill. It doesn't make them sore after their muscles remodel and adapt. But 
you know, I think when you're sore, it's also a good excuse to either cross train or jog or do something else. Mm -hmm. And what about if someone's sore from the 5K workouts that they're doing? I, I think the key thing is to build into them. And are they sore in the sense that they just sort of feel fatigue and no snap in their legs? Or do they actually feel this kind of uh, things, you know, that are more sharp than just an ache? If it's, if it's, they're just kind of fatigued and their legs feel like wood, just take it easy and go for a jog on a nice soft surface. If you actually have some tenderness and, and like, like you run a marathon and it's hard to go down the stairs, that sort of thing, take a few easy days and maybe cycle or do some other stuff. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, all right. Finally, last question. So you've worked a lot with elite athletes and, uh, what have you learned about the way elites train for races? I know there's a common misconception that elite athletes are like just talented. That's the only reason they can run well. It's just right. easy for them. How much of it is that? And, and what else comes into play from your work? I, I think when you talk to elites, you know, it's hard to generalize because these are one-off people and everybody's a little bit different, mm -hmm. but I think people are consistent. And to be consistent, you have to avoid injury. A lot of these people are lucky in the sense that they can handle relatively high training volumes without issues. Many of them have some sort of strong social support. If they run in a group, they've got a good family situation, they've got a nice club situation, whatever it might be. There are a few loners out there, people that, that it doesn't matter whether they're training with 10 people or training alone, they can just go out and hammer it. Mm -hmm. All of those things can make a difference. So I think that, that – um, you know, there are these general layer, generalizable things about elites, consistency, intensity, a program that works for them, a strong social support system. But I think at another level, if you've seen one elite, you've seen one elite. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they have is typically coaches or advisors who are able to customize uh, what they do and work around issues. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily about just them elite runners being, you know, well, it's just easy. You know, they get no, it easy. No, that most of them are really committed to it. Okay. And one of the things I think is going to be really interesting in the coming years is Gwen Jorgensen, the great triathlete, is going to make a strong effort to do very well in the marathon. And she's running in the low 240s. And I'll be curious to see how much of her triathlon training is retained because mm. it would seem to me that her skill at these other disciplines would allow her to do maybe a little bit more cross training and, and whether they'll cut that out or incorporate a lot of that into her marathon mm. training as progresses. Yeah. It'll be definitely. very interesting to see how that goes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay, Michael. Well, thank you so much. This has been so insightful and just really good to kind of dig in and, and a bit deeper than I would usually go in this kind of topic, but I think it's important to know and understand and you've given us some great advice. So thank you so much for your time. Wonderful to visit. You obviously love podcasts, right? You wouldn't be here otherwise. And as I, this is a bonus episode, I wanted to let you know about something else I have related to podcasts. If you love podcasts, you might enjoy my Running For Real podcast series. Now, I have six different series. I'm going to tell you a little bit about each in just a second. But what are these? These series are six to seven episodes about a specific topic that you might be interested in. And they have some of the best experts from all over the world who are here to give you specific advice on these topics. Along with that, you get a 15 to 20 page printout guide that you can use and it has referrals from people, it has suggestions, it has tips from these experts that are not included in the interview. I bug the heck out of them to make sure they gave me good advice. And if you haven't already checked out the podcast series, if you are a newer listener or if you are someone who just got a little bit busy when it came time to uh, check these out earlier in the year, I just wanted to remind you about them. So I do have a beginner runner podcast series, a coming back from injury. So that one is especially important if you are struggling with an injury, especially as we focus on the emotional and the mental side of injuries. On that note, I have a mental training series. If you are preparing for a race and the mental side of your running is what kind of holds you back, you definitely want to be checking that one out. There is a nutrition podcast series where we kind of look into all the different viewpoints of people who are experts in the industry so you can make your own mind up about what is the best nutritional path for you. There is a marathon podcast series. I don't have to explain that one. I think you kind of get what that one is. And uh, finally, there is a running through and after pregnancy podcast series. If you are thinking about getting pregnant or if you are pregnant, or even if you're postpartum, this is really going to help you. I get all the answers to all the questions. 
Now, on that note, I made sure each of these episodes are focused on a specific topic within that category. Really, really detailed. I'm really proud of these series. Price them way too low, so you're going to get them at a steal, and I cannot guarantee they're always going to be at the price they are right now. So head on over to tinamuir.com and head to the podcast tab. You will see them right there. Hope you enjoy. Thanks so much. My friends, if you have a minute and you could leave a review on your favorite podcast player, Apple Podcasts, aka iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Class, Spotify, or whatever else podcast player you use to listen to this podcast, or if you would subscribe to this podcast, you will help me get out in front of new runners to make our tribe even bigger and even better. It might not seem like you as one person can make a difference, but really it helps a lot. And it shows me you appreciate the hard work I put in for those. Thank you so much. Hopefully you were able to take a lot from this one to understand what your body is going through in training when you are training for a 5k and how it can help you in future longer races too. If you haven't tried a 5k recently, really, I mean, training for a 5k recently, maybe it's time to give it a go, especially if you feel like you're hitting your head against a brick wall for one of the longer races. There's nothing wrong with that. And as you kind of learned in this episode, it can help you in the longer distances in the future. So is one really one season really going to make that big of a difference if you did some speed work? It's not really going to be a huge difference between you, um, you know, missing your next marathon, but it could make all the difference with helping you to be able to run faster in that future marathon. So I suggest giving it a go. And if you are a 5k runner, just generally, then you I'm sure love this episode. Now, one other thing, be sure to read up on Dr. Michael. He has so much knowledge. And let me just tell you, he predicted that the sub two hour uh, barrier for the marathon could be broken back in 1991. Back then, no one believed him. He tried to get a paper out about it and he had to push really hard to get it out. But now we're getting close. Everyone thinks that's a possibility. So as you can tell in this episode, this guy is really smart and he knows his stuff. Everything, including that 400 workout he talked about, is available in the show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 91. Now, I know we haven't had an episode 90 yet, but as this is a bonus episode, I'd already set up episode 90. So these two this week are a bit out of order. Um, Now, on that note, on Friday, episode 90 is going to be an incredibly inspiring episode with Siri Lindley, who is the world triathlon champion. And this episode is not really about triathlon specifically, but it's more about getting the most out of yourself. Siri is absolutely one of my heroes. And you will see why this ep- in this episode on Friday, that this is going to be an episode you are going to go back to over and over again. I'm sure of that. And if you haven't already, go subscribe to the podcast on the channel that you are using right now. Do it right now. So you can have that episode come directly to you on Friday. Trust me, you do not want to miss this one. I hope you have a good week and I'll see you Friday. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.